Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. So we're, we're back on schedule. We have our FSC show, which I know everyone's excited about. So in today's uh, uh, discussion, we're going to look at what's happening in the U.S. now as we're coming out of that kind of March lull. What do we expect going forward? And then we're going to look at some of the shifts that have happened abroad now that we've had a lot of uh, different pressure points from Russia. What does it mean? How are things changing? And then a quick roundup on what is happening at the Fed and what do we expect going forward? Because rates, even though it doesn't seem like they should impact energy to uh, the degree that they will, I think it's important to look at what are rates doing? What is the Fed going to do? And how is that going to transition back to activity in the U.S. and really broadly speaking? So now back to our uh, frack spread show. So we came in at 275. So that's up from last week's 273. Uh, the increase was really driven by the Permian. I mean, no surprise there in terms of just where the activity is. Now, when we look at what act, what production is, right now we have us a, a closer to about 11.9 million barrels a day of production in the US. I think the EIA has uh, put at about 11.8. We're a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit below 11.9, about 11.87. You know, that's something that again we think trends higher, especially as we go through April into into uh, May, and we we do think that we'll get to about 290 spreads by the end of this month. And then that that last 10 should come in May. But then once we get to 300, that's where we start to see some of those disconnects. And that's when we're going to talk about something very specific to that with um, with uh, pipe and uh, and steel in general. But when you just look at, this, at the spread and the activity right now, we do expect to see, and we are starting to see a bit more in the Anadarko, you know, the Haynesville, East Texas still remains very active in comparison to 18 and 19. When you just think about where LNG is going, we've covered it multiple times. For those that are clients, with you got the uh, presentation that we did at the SPE event. There's where we talked about, you know, what is happening with LNG, the flows that are coming from Russia. So again, there's a lot of demand in the market for natural gas which again is going to keep the uh, the east of uh, the east side of Texas, Louisiana, and the, really the southern piece of Oklahoma fairly active. But when we get into spring and we get into activity, you need ducks. You need drilled but uncompleted wells. And here we are with a nice uh, surge in uh, in activity in the U.S. So here you can see 18 horizontal rigs uh, back at it. A large amount of them are obviously in the Permian. I think there was uh, nine that were in the Permian right now. Again, just when you look at what has happened in the east side, East Texas, especially the Eagle Ford, uh, spreads in, and uh, you know, uh, frack spreads and rigs have kind of flatlined. You know, so we're really not going to see too, uh, really a lot of ducks, but we're not going to see any real drawdown. They've kind of paired it almost perfectly. Where the Permian, we do expect to see a, a duck starting to increase a bit, and that's just going to give some of that additional running room in order to, to see some of that activity picking back up. And you know, I, as for those that didn't watch the EIA show, one of the other key pieces is we took up our expectation of exports to about 3.3 million barrels a day. So again, that also provides that opportunity because close to the to the coast, that ability to get into the international market because there is that demand right now, uh, especially because of what Saudi did on pricing. But we're also going to talk about propane butane in a minute because that is also a big piece of the uh, of the story. But when we look at North American steel, especially that, uh, you know, the OCD, uh, uh, the OCTG pipe, this is just looking at 5.5 diameter. Obviously, there's different types of diameter, but you can just see this, the sheer spike in pricing. And this is what we've been talking about. And, you know, we talked about it in, in our, uh, in our discussion and insights last week and the week before, but really when you start looking at steel and, uh, in the econ show yesterday, we talked about how obviously a huge amount of steel comes from Ukraine, Russia together. But then when you start looking at the, the implications, you know, Germany gets a lot of iron ore and other pieces from Russia, you know, where is that going to come from? And this is where we, we continue to see pricing remaining elevated. And a lot of this is just really a pass through, which is why even though obviously, you know, WTI is at $98, 
there's still a lot of reason to drill, but the cost to drill is going up, which is where some of that margin comes in. Because I know uh, on a political level, we keep hearing, oh, just, you know, just drill some more. It's like, well, it's not that simple. There's a lot of pieces of that, including diesel, pipe availability, labor, prop in, you know, where, where are things going? And again, this is, I think, a big component that we're going to continue to look at when we, when we talk about the surge in price, the surge in pipe and steel. Because if you start looking at spreads, as we said, you know, we could get to about 325 just based on the horsepower out there, but it costs money to build horsepower. It co- it takes steel. It takes all of these different pieces. So uh, the cost of building new spreads is obviously going up as well. Then one of the things that we didn't cover in the EIA show when they announced their, <laughs> their nice little surge in uh, official selling price is they also took uh, propane and butane prices back to 2014 highs. Now, when you look at India, and we'll talk about how India has been increasing a lot of their LPG imports, this is going to hit hard at the emerging market level and also provide some opportunity for the U.S. to continue to be as dominant as we have been in the, uh, in the LPG market market, which again, when, you know, if you follow that backwards, also supports pricing at the wellhead, because when you start breaking it into the three streams of oil, liquids, natural gas, that uh, liquids is going to uh, remain strong, especially when you look at where prices are globally, and then natural gas, when we consider where LNG is going, and then obviously in the US, natural gas prices are over $6, currently $6.31. So when we start looking at where prices are, you know, things pulled back a bit, but again, we had our shoulder season. We're coming back out of that. Now, as we get back into spring, we start seeing a bit more activity. Obviously, we don't need propane for heating the same way, but it's going to be uh, uh, very much involved in uh, the export market, which is why we do see a lot of support at this price. And we do think that things will move closer to about a dollar thirty as we start looking down through the system. But for those that remembered, you know, it's things that we talked about, we discussed how Russia has very limited uh, crude storage, about eight days of storage. So when you start looking at the pressure that they're under to, again, get some of this crude into the market, it, the reason why you're seeing these massive differentials, and you know, right now we're back to about $34, $35 below dated Brent with the screens, again, speaking to, to the physical market, something much closer to uh, to 41 to $42 is because they need to get it out of the system. They have to get it on the water. And it, the, re- the real reason is because they're running tight on capacity. You know, facilities could be full in about 50 days just based on the current trend. And Russia can tempor- temporarily put about 200 million barrels in pipe and ship. But for those in the energy space, you understand that putting crude in pipe and then just leaving it there is very difficult because you have to make sure that they have the, the right coatings. They have to make sure that you know there's no water contact to the pipe. So it's very costly to do that. And then obviously when you talk about ships, what's the insurance? What's the day rate? And when you start looking at insurance prices, you know, they're essentially things coming out of the Black Sea are border are borderline uninsurable. And it, essentially the insurance is, is, a, is almost the full cost of the ship at this point. So what is Russia going to do? And this is what we've seen. They've offered to waive uh, letters of credit n- uh, necessities. They've also offered uh, to transact in local currency with the most recent one in, in Yuan. But when you start looking at the at the different backdrops, well, how do you cover the insurance? And that's when the central banks can step in, uh, i.e. the RBI and the PBOC, and they can say, look, instead of going to an insurance carrier to back it, we'll back it, and that will uh, uh, bring down some of these costs, but it's going to come at a price, and that's why our we do see more uh, more slippage in a lot of these different pieces. So when we start looking at some of the different levels, spare capacity at storage res- uh, reserves, uh, reservoirs operated by Russian oil producers dropped nearly 27% between March 1st and April 1st, according to data from the energy, energy minister. Uh, at the start of the month, only 20.2 million barrels of space remained, which could be filled up within the 50-day time frame which is why Russian oil volumes and floating storage have jumped. We've started to see it move again, but this is what we continue to see with this pressure of how do they get it into the market? How do they move it and clear it? Because they need to make sure that they're not shutting down. And shut-ins wouldn't be a huge problem. Again, they're, they're not ideal, but when you look at 
the scientists, the reservoir engineers, the engineers in general, the capacity, a lot of the top drives, a lot of the technology is sourced from Germany, from the U.S. So the question is, how do they continue to, to get some of this capacity in, given where sanctions are at the moment? Which is why we're going to continue to see this getting pushed into uh, into the uh, into the, you know, just the uh, the global market. Now, India fuel sales uh, sales of diesel by the three largest uh, retailers were up twenty two percent month over month. Uh, they were also ten percent higher year on year and up five percent from March twenty nineteen, which is kind of that bellwether. And a lot of that was also because people are starting to hoard ahead of the uh, expected price hikes, given the issues that are happening there. But regardless, that also pushed things much higher. When you look at diesel, diesel is now back above pre-pandemic levels. Gasoline, 17% month on month, 14% compared to March. But LPG up 4% month on month, up 12% year on year. That's where, again, when you look at inflation and some of the issues, they're they're looking to increase the amount of capacity that they're bringing in, i.e., especially from Russia. So they've increased their uh, their purchases. They're up to about 540 barrels a day, uh, which is almost double what they were in March. So again, India is trying to take in and take advantage of the Jeep crude especially as you see prices continuing to move higher. Now, when we, when we uh, pair that back and look at China, so China's been struggling. There's about 22 million barrels that are stranded offshore, <clears throat> mixture of Russia, Venezuelan, and Iranian crude, but they still have super, uh, a decent amount of super tankers aiming and uh, signaling the port uh, and coming in. The question is going to be, how do they bring it on shore given you know, the lockdowns, the fall in demand. Yeah, you know, we've seen another pair back in activity when we start looking at driving uh, capacity. Europe is slow to touch. U.S. is fairly, uh, fairly stable. Same with um, some of the other Asian nations. So when we look at it, it's really Europe and China that have slowed. The U.S., again, we've talked about it flatlining at this point with a little bit of a bump coming, especially as we come into Easter break. And this is one of those uh, uh, interesting years where you have Easter, Passover, and Ramadan all, or the end of Ramadan, I should say, starting uh, coming in at the same time. Again, that which will provide a little bit of an uplift to the gasoline front. But when you start looking at flows, this is the the issues are also starting to impede what is happening within West Africa, where you we still have over I think it's over eight cargoes left in Angola, you know over fifteen and uh, actually something closer to almost thirty uh, for April when you start uh, for April into May when you start looking at Angola in Nigeria because China and India well why wouldn't you go buy cheaper uh, Russian crude? And that's, again, putting that pressure on West Africa. And we've had uh, Fortes and other types of European crudes also cut pricing. Uh, Fortes just went across at a 23-month low when you start looking at some of these different uh, impacts on the underlying physical market. So then when we start looking at UN prices, here you can see that the uh, UN food price is at a record. Uh, food prices, uh, and uh, so the quote is, when food prices rise, regime shifts follow. So in 2011, food prices rose ahead of the Arab Spring, or for those outside the US, the peasant uprising. In 2022, we have curfews in, in Peru and a state of emergency in Sri Lanka on the heels of rising prices, and we're still there. Nigeria is struggling right now because they've had to increase the subsidies for um, uh, for uh, you know gasoline and and other, and that's only getting worse based on some of the data that we have here, which is North American nutrient prices. They've come down, but when you look at where they've been for going back to 2008, you get an idea that even though they've fallen, they're still near records. And this is based on corn assumptions, where corn acreage is expected to fall, and that has softened it. But again, you're just coming off the highs. When you zoom out, you get an idea that. We're still near record highs, keeping that pressure. Now, uh, the USDA WASD just came out. Uh, corn was a bit higher than expectation of 305 versus 300. Soybeans essentially right in line at 89.5. But wheat, again, continues to be the problem, continues to be a, a big concern. Uh, you know, it's it surged in uh, in trading today. Expectation was for 281, came in at 278, and things are continuing to worsen, especially when we look at the U.S. This is a price summary of the Office of the uh, Chief Economist. 
and you can see that the change in pricing uh, on March, uh, you know, in terms of just from March 9th, uh, pretty much a sweep across the board with prices going up. The change from 2020 and 2021, you can see is just continuing to go higher. And based on the forecast, there is more to come again, creating these underlying problems, which is why when we start looking at how, who's exposed to high food prices, I think this was a great chart as looking at the scorecard. Nigeria is at the top of the rank. The biggest or the bigger issue when we start talking about this is India. India remains at the, at the top end. They're in the top five. And when you just think about the size of the country, the issues that they're already experiencing on economic growth and inflation, that becomes a huge issue. Speaking on inflation, you get an idea of where the Fed's balance sheet sits. Now, remember, they, they're capping their, uh, their quantitative tightening at $95 billion per month over three months starting in May. So the question is going to be, how do they do it? So $50 billion per month cap as in 2017 uh, roll off, you get an idea of what it is. But no roll off. The reason why if there's no roll off, you still get a dip is because things expire. So essentially, as things mature, you're just not going out and buying new. So there's going to be kind of that balance between what is rolling off naturally. So out of that 95 billion per month, some of that will naturally happen. And there's going to be some of that shrinking of the balance sheet, which again is going to put a bit more pressure on paper, push yields up as bond prices come down. And you get an idea of just even from 2020, the amount of capacity. I think uh, we added about $5 trillion just looking at where we are today and what has to be drawn down in that time frame. All the while, when you start looking at how things are shifting at the consumer level, consumers borrowing surge in February by most on record, coming in at 41 1.8 billion. Uh, the revolving credit rose $18 billion, largest on record. And the and the problem is you have people who their savings have uh, their savings rate has declined. Savings have been drawn down. Wages have uh, have gone up, not keeping pace with inflation. So what do you do? You go and borrow. And this is where we continue to see a lot of these pressure points on the credit front. But as this this these issues expand, what do you see? But obviously inventory is expanding. And here you can see that inventories went up again. Uh, the expectation was for 2.1%. Instead, it was up 2.5%. Again, coming back and tying the high uh, the highs that we saw at the end of 2021, which is what we were talking about in December when we saw some of those issues. It continues to get worse, which is why when you start looking at global world new orders to inventories, things are getting worse again because new orders continue to slow. Again, that leading indicator of where that global economy, that capacity looks like. It's still expanding. You're still, you're still above 50, but you can see the trajectory and just where those leading indicators are pointing to. Again, point, uh, again back to energy, reducing diesel demand, reducing gasoline demand, you know, just because as people tighten up. And, and, and again, there's a certain amount of inelasticity. I'm not saying that there isn't. The, it, there is some flexibility. And that's why we look at the, some of these things, especially when you start talking about supply and all the reasons that Russia has no choice. They have to keep pushing this crude into the market at almost any cost at this point, just because they have to make sure that they keep things operational because their concern is if they go offline, they won't be able to bring it back due to the quote unquote brain drain and the uh, the lack of uh, of equipment there in in inventory to repair anything that breaks. So that's what we have for you today. If you have any questions, you can find me on on uh, Twitter. You can find me in the comments section. You know we're finally back in on our normal schedule. So I, I will see you next week uh, as normal. Uh, hopefully you have a great weekend and a great uh, spring weekend because it should be a little bit nicer. I know it's a little rainy on Saturday, but hopefully uh, you know things are here to uh, to kick things off. So uh, thanks for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network.